thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, to read and discuss this paper. Um, I, I have I have some 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 work on reserves and 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 uh, and this was this was a nice read because uh, it let me think of a, of a different angle I haven't I haven't been um, uh, thinking of uh, before. Okay, so let me start with the summary of the paper. So exposed, it's a good thing that I have a, a short discussion. So um, I'm happy about that uh, coincidence. Um, so this this is the motivation, the motivating evidence, and the goal of the paper. Uh, so uh, the author starts by 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 noting this uh, this uh, uh, spectacular increase in, in foreign reserves in emerging in emerging economies, and then and then not only they say that uh, that this is uh, you know an interesting fact in itself, but also uh, make the point that it's crucial to understand the direction of of capital flows or other capital flows uh, 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 that we observe. Okay. And, and from that, they move to, to my uh, point two here, uh, which is that they, they, they talk about this negative correlation between growth and net capital flows. And, and they say that, uh, <clears throat> well, that this is driven mostly by, by these uh, uh, official reserves. Um, okay, and so that, that brings us to, to point three, that uh, there is this uh, positive correlation uh, now between growth and, and reserve accumulation. Okay, so, uh, uh, the, the point of the paper is, you know, think about these three facts uh, and, and essentially uh, uh, do what, what's in this shaded box at, uh, at the bottom of the slide. It's, the goal of the paper is to provide a framework uh, to jointly explain, you know, these this behaviors of private and uh, capital uh, and public uh, flows in uh, fast-growing uh, emerging economies. Okay? So, so that's, that's, that's what they, uh, they want to do. They want to provide a theory to to sort of uh, to think about this in an, in an orderly way. Um, so uh, let me highlight here the, the key elements of the model. It's a, it's a relatively straightforward model with two sectors, tradable and non-tradable. It's a small open economy. And the, the paper has, I think, three key, key elements. The first is that uh, there is this knowledge externality that uh, uh, Luca uh, explained. Um, so knowledge, uh, uh, I mean, he had to go fast through his slides, but knowledge is essentially like a labor augmented productivity. Um, and knowledge is accumulated by importing M, which is an, uh, which is an imported intermediate input. Okay, so essentially knowledge, uh, you can think of knowledge if you want a, a TFP here for a second, and uh, the, the, the law of motion for it is that knowledge tomorrow is gonna be, you know, some uh, um, undepreciated if you want knowledge from today, plus, the new knowledge production that it's a, co a combination of uh, you know, the stock of knowledge and the uh, uh, and your your uh, imports. So you, you learn by importing. Okay. The key the key here is that the firms do not internalize this, right? So that's where the externality is going to come from. The second key element is that there are financial frictions and risk of sudden stops. Okay. So the firms, uh, <clears throat> uh, in order to import need loans to finance this. So these are the working capital loans, okay? So there is an underlying lack of commitment that makes uh, uh, foreign lenders uh, decrease the amount or, or restrict the amount of, of loans that uh, they're willing to give uh, the firms uh, for, for this uh, uh, import financing. And, and that's where this borrowing constraint uh, comes from. And, and what the silent stops do is that they tighten this borrowing constraint, okay? They, they uh, randomly make this borrowing constraint uh, tighter, okay? Um, and so th those are the two points highlighted uh, uh, by Luca. And, and the other point that's, that's also important and it's also mentioned in the, in the paper is that the use of official reserves, uh, that, let me say that again, reserves and private debt are imperfect substitutes. Okay? If they were to be perfect substitutes, then, then the, the private sector uh, would probably undo what, what the public sector does. Okay? So the fact that they are imperfect substitutes is, is important. So uh, what, the, what, the, what the model and the authors do is precisely show that reserve accumulation by, by the government matters for both, matters for growth, which is highlighted here in, in point one, uh, and matters, matters for liquidity, which is more related to, uh, uh, to point two, okay? So I'll, I'll do the opposite uh, um, timing. I'll, Luca first uh, talked about uh, the, the knowledge part. I first um, wanna talk about the, the crisis part. Uh, so uh, the borrowing constraint is uh, this one here on top, uh, just to uh, remind everyone what, what uh, the terms are. D is the liquidity injection by the government, and that's using their reserves. 
B is uh, the starting private debt, and uh, X is knowledge, and Kappa is this, uh, uh, this sudden stop uh, shock. Okay. Uh, M is the import of intermediate goods, P is their price, and a fraction uh, phi of those need to be paid up front. Okay, so we can rewrite this, uh, this in, in, in this way. And what I have on the, on the left hand side is the working capital loan. These are the needs for financing, right? I, I, I like to rewrite it this way because now everything on the right hand side is predetermined or exogenous. And then, and then the, the borrowing is uh, the amount that I need to borrow is on the, on the left hand side. Now, when kappa is kappa, so kappa can take two values, high and low. Uh, kappa high is tranquil times, and I haven't talked about that yet. But when kappa is low, that then that does a sudden stop. Okay, so there the government can step in and deploy the reserves, which essentially is uh, using DT to soften this this hit. Okay, that's what I would call like a, like a stabilization role of of, uh, of reserves or a liquidity role of reserves. Okay, so. Uh, an interesting uh, thing here is that doing that helps with the crisis today because it allows uh, um, um, firms to, to, uh, uh, to borrow more and to produce more, but also helps with the knowledge accumulation. So therefore helps uh, with, with what's going to happen to the borrowing constraint in the future. Okay, so that, that's, that's uh, uh, going on. Right, so that's, that's, the, that's the sort of the use of reserves during crisis. Now, uh, but reserve accumulation is also helpful while, while we are not in the sign stop, as, as the title of the slide says. Okay, so in tranquil times, uh, um, the, 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 what, what the economy, the government is doing here is building up these this reserves. Okay, uh, so it's building up the reserves for two reasons to use them in the sign stop that, that I just, just, just talked about, but also because it has an effect on growth during tranquil times. And this is where the externality uh, is at, uh, at full play, right? Uh, the FX accumulation takes tradable resources away from the private sector, so decreases tradable consumption. That decreases the real uh, exchange rate and makes, uh, makes it more profitable to allocate resources to the tradable sector, meaning labor to the tradable sector. Uh, and that increases the demand for imported inputs, which increases knowledge, which increases growth. Okay, so this mechanism here uh, sort of highlights why the government will want to use FX accumulation as, as a way to stimulate growth in, in, in the second best in the second best world. Right. So what they find is if, if they if they can if we focus on the planner solution, I mean in, in internalizing externality, then the planner uh, will use zero reserves. Okay, even, even if the reserves are useful for liquidity during, during uh, silent stops, uh, everything they show that everything can, can be done with B, meaning with private uh, uh, debt, and a subsidy on, on, on the uh, accumulation of M, right? So uh, what the author says is that implementing this sectoral uh, subsidy is politically infeasible, and therefore uh, the use of reserves as, as a second best uh, instrument. Okay. Um, then they, they, they find that uh, when they look for the ex ante optimal reserve management rule, uh, which they do in a, a numerical exercise, they find that their model features fast reserve accumulation in the data and higher growth and larger current account surpluses uh, than in the no intervention equilibrium. And doing this, they find significant welfare gains. Uh, 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 one thing to notice is that most of the welfare gains come from uh, uh, using the reserves to stabilize output, uh, which is something that's consistent with uh, our findings uh, in, a, in a related paper with, uh, with, uh, with Bianchi, where, where we uh, uh, essentially study the role of reserve accumulations to uh, uh, stabilize output when, when, um, when the economy is subject to sovereign risk, essentially. And, and, and there we show that, 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 uh, uh, that this is a, this is a, a key um, motive to accumulate reserves and, and that in fact can also lead to significant welfare gains. Okay? But they also find that uh, uh, welfare gains can be positive even if, if uh, even in, in, a, in a situation in which uh, the government is prohibited from using them uh, to stabilize up. Okay? So that's, that's sort of a broad summary and, and, and some comments along the way. Um, I think it's a neat angle on, on the topic of reserve accumulation. I haven't uh, thought a lot about it uh, uh, in particular, so I, I kind of liked it. I had some specific comments. Um, and uh, 
uh, some some smaller comments that maybe I'll send by email. Okay, so the the, the main comment I have is uh, how how reserve uh, accumulations finance. Okay, so reserves are financed with lumps and taxes on the on the tradable uh, stock here and the tradable output. Uh, however, we know, and, and this point was brought up by uh, uh, Philip Baqueta uh, earlier, that reserves are financed in, in, in many different ways in the data, in particular using external liabilities, using domestic remunerated liabilities, and, and also using unsterilized money. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, we have a new paper with uh, Federico Sturzenegger where we, uh, where we show that how we finance reserves matters. Um, we, our, our paper focused on, on the effect on sovereign spreads, but uh, so it's not uh, directly applicable here, but it, it sort of highlights the, the bigger point that how we do this financing actually matters. So there we find that using domestic liabilities actually uh, uh, can help reduce the spread. So I guess what I want to say is that a slightly richer model where not necessarily having you know explicit uh, sovereign debt considerations, but where some notion of, of, of the sovereign spread uh, if, if some notion of, of that matters for the working capital loans, then how we finance the, the reserves is, is non-trivial, and then and then that that's uh, uh, that that's going to play a role and, and potentially uh, uh, mitigate the benefits found in this paper. So for this paper, I will sort of uh, encourage the authors to to think uh, about robustness of their results to having other forms of financing the reserves. In particular, maybe they could they could put some uh, uh, sort of exogenous. Uh, distortionary uh, uh, component in, in, in that tax. The second comment I'm gonna have, which is probably gonna be the last one, is that I have some mixed feelings about the, the numerical uh, exercises. On the one hand, the, the paper has a line that says, the model is too simple to lend itself to a careful calibration exercise, which I sort of uh, agree with in a sense, like I, I understand the, the spirit of the comment. But on the other hand, we, meaning the authors and I, wanna take the welfare number seriously. Okay, so and 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 I and I and I see the author saying like we find the welfare gains to be significant, so it means that they they want to take the number seriously and and, and I agree with that. So it, it's I see the paper sort of as, as, as in this middle ground of of uh, of uh, uh, um, using the numerical results, but but not uh, but not being um, um, uh, you know super careful with the calibration. Um, so what I what I want to say is I want to encourage the authors to go for it. Um, maybe one way forward is is to think about robustness to to varying key parameters, and in that sense you can sort of bound the results for us and and tell us you know if you move your key parameters in some reasonable parameter space, in particular looking for the worst case scenario for your story, uh, does the main result survive? And even if it doesn't survive, I think it's you know, from for quantitative uh, macro, I think it's very informative to know where it breaks down because uh, it, we, we learn from that. So what are the conditions under which uh, and the main result stops uh, uh, going forward? Um, I have some assorted comments that I'm gonna skip. And I say that uh, I think it's a nice paper. It's a neat angle on reserve accumulation and, and, and I'll, I'll encourage the authors to go deeper on the quantitative analysis. Um, looking forward to the next and last iteration. Thanks.